Namaste. So, the series before last was about dependent arising, the process of becoming. And the process of becoming is the trap that causes us to be stuck in duality. But it's also the process of enlightenment because we have to turn that process on its head and use it to become free. So we showed how the descent into duality, when it's uprooted, and when the process of becoming ceases, then automatically the Eightfold Path and the Four Path Fruits manifest automatically. Then in the last series, we showed how there is a very deep, um, high-level ontological um, alignment between the four paths and the Shankaracharya's four darshanam, chapter darshanam, the four views. And starting from duality, to that's Dvaitavada, then conditioned duality, Vishishta Dvaitavada, then there's the appearance of the world, and finally the unborn, Ajatavada. So these four stages exactly mirror the process of enlightenment given by the Buddha. And what is the goal? Or what is the object of that process? Emptiness. Now I know Westerners are terrified of emptiness. And not only Westerners. <laughs> One of the reasons why emptiness is not better known is uh, within the Buddha's followers themselves. Let me read this prediction by the Buddha. In times to come, monks will lose interest in the deep suttas that deal with transcendence. They will not listen to those suttas that have to do with emptiness, sunyata. They will not think it even worthwhile learning or pondering over the meanings of those suttas. And of course, this is exactly what happened. What happened was, Buddha's teaching was originally for people on the levels of, of Ajatavada and Vivartavada, who had come to terms with the ultimate nature of emptiness and who were willing to meditate in order to attain it. But then, later on, the Buddhists divorced themselves from Vedic culture, and they had to substitute their own levels of Dvaitavada and Vishishta Dvaitavada. And the monks became preoccupied with preaching to the broad multitudes instead of the highly qualified uh, minority that the Buddha had concentrated on. So they stopped teaching and preaching about emptiness. They stopped teaching the practices and they concentrated on the precepts only. And this was actually a debate that took place in the Theravada order about 1500 to 2000 years ago in Sri Lanka. That the scholars were saying, no, the practices don't matter as much as the philosophy. And uh, unfortunately, the scholars won. And so in modern day Buddhism, the commentaries and philosophical discussions have assumed more importance, uh, the, the moral rules and so on, the precepts, have assumed a dominant role and the practices uh, are very much subordinate to them. In fact, they're very rare, almost unknown. 
Only in the isolated forest monastery traditions have these practices continued. So, of course, my teachers were all from the forest monastery tradition. And uh, we look upon the populist Buddhism uh, as merely a, a dualistic religion, which it is. But because of that, the uh, Buddhist society, culture has lost track or lost sight of shunyata, emptiness, as the ultimate goal. This is a great tragedy because actually this emptiness is the key to enlightenment. When the discourses of the Tathagata, deep, deep in their meaning, transcendent, connected with emptiness, are recited, the monks listen, they lend ear, they set their hearts on knowing them, they regard them as worth grasping and mastering. And when they have mastered that Dhamma, they cross-question one another about it and dissect it. How is this? What is the meaning of this? They make open what isn't open, make plain what isn't plain, dispel doubt on its various doubtful points. This is called an assembly trained in cross-questioning and not in bombast. Bombast means dogma, huh? Bible pounding <laughs> fundamentalism. So this kind of fundamentalism has taken over the Buddha's teaching, unfortunately. And because of that, now when we talk about uh, sunyata, emptiness, or paticca samuppada, dependent arising, or really any of the advanced topics of spiritual life, chatur darshanam and so on, we get very, very few questions that lead to interesting discussions. People are inclined to either accept on faith or reject on doubt. And they don't really take the effort to inquire into things and look into them and question them and bring them out the way the Buddha describes here. The few that do tend to be very advanced on the path. And of course, uh, they're the people that I want as friends. And I want to be surrounded by very intelligent, very advanced, very strong people who have their own views and the ability to research the traditions, to explain them and defend them, and to also be strong enough to have a dialogue and submit their views to cross-questioning without fear. That's our position, or that's our standard. And we're hoping that more people will come to that standard in time. The practice of sunyata, the practice of emptiness. It's not really as scary as it seems. Huh? Let me read you another quote from the Buddha. Suppose a monk sits down in an empty place at the root of a tree and well contemplates bodily form as being impermanent, being a nature of a nature to wear away and to fade away. In the same way, he examines feeling, perception, sankhara, and consciousness as being impermanent, being of a nature to wear away and to fade away. Examining those aggregates as being impermanent, of a nature to wear away, to be unstable, and to change. His mind is delighted, purified, and liberated. This is called emptiness. One who contemplates in this way, even though not yet able to be free from conceit, purifies his knowledge and vision. By contemplating on impermanence, the mind is delighted, purified and refreshed. Huh? It's not scary, it's beautiful. 
The beauty of emptiness is something I've been talking about on this channel for a long time. But very, very few people can grasp it. Only those who have really done the work and advanced to the point where they realize it for themselves. It's too bad because emptiness is the universal solvent that dissolves the process of being and becoming and leads to freedom from entanglement in manifestation. So this is the key, actually. If you learn one thing from this channel, learn emptiness, learn how to approach it, learn how to contemplate it, learn how to see that all things that are manifest are impermanent. And the only thing that's lasting is emptiness. Look upon the world as void, Mogaraja, being mindful at all times, uprooting the lingering view of self. Get well beyond the range of death. The king of death gets no chance to see him who looks thus upon the world. Mogaraja had approached the Buddha and he was asking for a way to get relief from the anxieties of managing his kingdom. And this is the reply. <laughs> Beautiful answer from the Buddha. Huh? That look upon the world as void. Huh? What is that wonderful uh, quote from the Bible? Or maybe it's not from the Bible. This too shall pass. All these things, this stuff, all these beings, all these manifestations, all these conditions and situations will pass away, including ourselves. This self, this being, this identity, this I, and, and especially this mind, all the things that we're identified with as possessions or extensions of the self will all pass away. So we should not get entangled with them. We should not get attached to them. That doesn't mean that we necessarily give up everything and go live in a cave. Well, what it means is that we give up the attachment to them. We give up being a slave to our possessions. And this is tough advice to give a person in the 21st century. Because everyone is so much identified with their possessions, their social status, their income, their professional position, uh, their uh, position in their community, spiritual or social community or whatever. And they think that this is me, this is I, this is myself. But realize that all those things will pass away in time. Well, like I used to say, <laughs> die now, avoid the rush. <laughs> Instead of having to give all these things up by force at the time of death, give them up now by relinquishing the attachment to them. Then it will not be so painful. It won't be so difficult and it will be gradual. Buddha's teaching is based on the acceptance of emptiness and timelessness. Now, if you accept these things now, even theoretically, then you will gradually be able to approach emptiness without difficulty. That's why we favor the Buddha's approach over the Vedic approach. Because the Vedic approach encourages a more and more subtle identification until one is actually identified with Brahman. And having to give up that identification in order to actually attain emptiness is very difficult. It feels like death. It's very scary. Ask anybody who's been through it. But on the Buddhist path, one deals with that early. 
and gradually. And so it doesn't become like a big stumbling block at the highest level of the path. And one's progress is smooth and certain and comes to the same conclusion, but with much less difficulty and trauma. So this will be continued in the next episode. Aum Tatsa, Buddha Saranai.